In today's video, we're going to look at how you can calculate the intrinsic value of a common stock and why it is so important to long-term investment success. Hello everybody, this is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, aka Mr. Valuation. In today's video, we're going to learn how to calculate the intrinsic value of your common stocks, and I'm going to show why it's so important to investing and to investing success. So let's get started. Every investor in common stocks is faced with the challenge of knowing when to buy, sell, or hold. And additionally, this challenge will be approached differently by a true investor than it would by a speculator. But since I know very little about speculation, in other words, trading or market timing, this video will be focused on assisting true investors who are desirous of a sound and reliable method that they can trust and implement when attempting to make these important buy, sell, or hold investing decisions. Furthermore, it logically follows that true investing requires a diligent focus and comprehensive understanding of the true worth of any business under consideration. This last notion logically extends to a second notion implying that true investors are also value investors, at least on some level. Consequently, it further highlights the importance of having at least a reasonable idea of what any business you own or are considering owning in the future is worth to successfully invest over the long term. However, there's an additional layer of complexity that applies to the concept of identifying the true worth of a business. Now, within the jargon of Wall Street, there are many expressions of true worth, that are bannered about that are often vague and imprecisely, Im imprecisely thrown about. For example, when attempting to quantify the value of a business, the four most common expressions you will hear will be it's either the intrinsic value, the fair value, the fundamental value, and or the true worth. Now in truth, these are not synonyms, but often utilized as if they were. Nevertheless, all four share a common objective. Whether you call it intrinsic value, fair value, fundamental value, or true worth, the central idea is to quantify optimum prices or valuation levels which make the most sense regarding making sound decisions to buy, sell, or hold a given stock. And even though they're not exact synonyms, they are all close enough to be of practical value. In other words, all four of these expressions of valuation are focused on calculating and knowing what the businesses you own are actually worth within a reasonable range. Therefore, your decisions can be sound and beneficial to your long-term performance. Semantics aside, it all comes down to having an intelligent framework to accurately make sound long-term investment decisions. Therefore, even though I believe it is useful and important to attempt to try and apply some precision to these definitions regarding true worth, intrinsic value, fundamental value, or fair value, investing need not be a game of perfect. This is simply because investing is really never a game of perfect. Consequently, at their essence, in regards to making successful investment decisions, these are all concepts that can be utilized to identify the value of a business. However, there are differences and even nuances that each imply in their own right. On the other hand, the real test supporting any of them is whether or not they can be utilized in real-world applications. I will cover this last point much more extensively later in this video. Intrinsic value. What a concept. In my opinion, it's one of the mistakes that many investors make when attempting to calculate intrinsic value is that they are too strict or rigid with the application of the various mathematical formulas suggested. Intrinsic value is not a precise calculation. In reality, it is best thought of as attempting to identify a reasonable range of fair value. The primary benefit of identifying a reasonable range of fair value is to empower you, the long-term prudent investor, the ability to fully participate in the business results of the company behind the stock. Among the most famous and respected formulas for calculating fair value are Ben Graham's formulas. Therefore, the concept of intrinsic value is most often associated with the legendary and widely considered father of value investing, Ben Graham. In addition to referencing the term intrinsic value numerous times in his seminal work, the intelligent investor, Ben Graham also is credited with proposing his famous Ben Graham formula for calculating intrinsic value. The formula described by Ben Graham in the 1962 edition of Security Analysis is as follow. V equals intrinsic value. Earnings EPS is the trailing 12 months earnings per share. 
8.5 is the PE base or minimum for a no growth company. G is reasonably expected 7 to 10 year growth rate. So in 1974, Ben revised his formula to more accurately account for changes in interest rates. What is really important here is to recognize that Ben Graham's approach to calculating intrinsic value evolved as his knowledge and experience also evolved. Ben's revived 1974 intrinsic value formula is as follows. V, or intrinsic value, is earnings per share, the company's last 12 months earnings per share, times 8.5, the constant, representing the appropriate P-E ratio for a no-growth company as proposed by Ben, the company's long-term five-year earnings growth rate, and then 4.4 is the average yield of high-grade corporate bonds in 1962 when this model was introduced. Y is the current yield on AAA corporate bonds. The FastGraph's fundamental analyzer software tool that I co-developed provides real-world evidence of Ben Graham's formula at work. Now, the FastGraph research tool automatically applies Ben's classic formula on companies when earnings growth is 5% or less. This is important and necessary adjustment, as I will discuss in greater detail later. Additionally, a common price-earnings ratio multiple of 15 is often applied, but sometimes when growth is really slow, lower multiples can be calculated and applied as well. Nevertheless, it's also useful to understand and recognize Ben Graham's view of the 15 P.E. ratio. But before we go there, there was a lot more behind Ben Graham's work than relying on a simple formula. Ben believed in and practiced comprehensive fundamental research and analysis, and I highly recommend that you do as well. Moreover, he shared his concepts and beliefs extensively through his books, of course, the most famous of which is The Intelligent Investor. The following excerpt found on pages 337 and 338 summarizes his seven recommendations to what he referred to as the defensive investor. However, it's also important to recognize two important points. Number one, these were offered as recommendations to conservative, or as he called them, defensive investors, but not as absolutes. Point number two, the viewer should also consider that Ben Graham developed these recommendations when America was primarily an industrial economy prior to evolving in today's more prevalent service-based economy. Ben's seven recommendations are as follows. First, he wanted a company of adequate size. Two, he wanted a company with a sufficiently strong financial condition. Number three, he wanted continued dividends for at least the past 20 years. Number four, he didn't want to see any earnings deficits in the past 10 years. Number five, he wanted a 10-year growth rate of at least one-third in per-share earnings. Now, my calculations suggest this implies a 3.33% earnings minimum. Price of the stock, he wanted no more than one and a half times net asset value, and he also wanted no more than 15 times average earnings of the past three years. Now, consequently, most of the business that Ben Graham was originally evaluating were rich in very intangible assets. Therefore, his recommendation number six was more appropriate for tangible asset-based corporations, but less so for companies operating in today's service-based economy, where many companies' balance sheets also include significant levels of intangible assets. Therefore, applying a price calculation of the value of intangible assets, such as intellectual property and goodwill, is much more challenging than valuing a building or piece of equipment, and so on. However, I feel it's important to interject here that a business derives its value from the amount of cash flow it can generate on behalf of its stakeholders. Discounting those cash flows is paramount. Intangible assets, just like tangible assets, can and do produce a significant cash flow for many service and technological-based companies. Therefore, even though they are more difficult to accurately value, they can and often do produce true economic value. Now, the main point I'm trying to make here is that I believe Ben Graham laid a solid foundation for rational approaches to valuing a business. However, I also recognize and believe that it is incumbent upon his devotees and followers to build upon the foundation that Ben laid. Now, his most famous student, of course, is Warren Buffett, and Buffett provides some perspective on this hypothesis as follows, and I quote, you can have a full and rewarding life without ever thinking about goodwill or its amortization. But students of investment and management should understand the nuances of the subject. 
My own thinking has changed drastically from 35 years ago when I was taught to favor tangible assets and to shun businesses who value dependent largely upon economic goodwill. This bias caused me to make many important business mistakes of omission, although relatively few of commission. John Maynard Keynes identified my problem when he said, the difficulty lies not in new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. My escape was long delayed, Warren said, in part, because most of what I had been taught by the same teacher had been, and continues to be, so extraordinarily valuable. Ultimately, business experience, direct and vicarious, produced by present strong preference for businesses that possess large amounts of enduring goodwill and that utilize a minimum of tangible assets. So therefore, once again, Warren Buffett provided the following additional perspective on the necessity of building upon Ben Graham's foundational concept as follows, and again I quote, Thus our first lesson, businesses logically are worth far more than net tangible assets when they can be expected to produce earnings on such assets considerably in excess of market rates of return. The capitalized value of this excess return is economic goodwill. Now, this section of this video is intended to primarily focus on Ben Graham's recommendation number seven, price no more than 15 times average earnings of the past three years. Additional references about the 15 P.E. ratio principle were made on the following excerpts from the revised edition of The Intelligent Investor reveal that stock selection for the defensive investor on page 349 wanted a moderate price earnings ratio. And in there, it said current price should not be more than 15 times average earning of the past three years. A moderate ratio of price to assets. Ben believed that current price should not be more than one and a half times the book value last reported. However, a multiplier of earnings below 15 could justify a correspondingly higher multiple of assets. And as a rule of thumb, I suggest that the product of the multiplier times the ratio of price to book value should not exceed 22.5. This figure corresponds to 15 times earnings and one and a half times book. On page 350 of The Intelligent Investor, Ben also stated that the suggested maximum figure of 15 times earnings might well result in a typical portfolio with an average multiplier of, say, even 12 to 13 times earnings. I'll cover that later. Clearly, Ben had a strong focus and opinion regarding a P.E. ratio of 15 as an important valuation reference. Frankly, I support this concept of P.E. of 15 representing fair value, at least on the majority of publicly traded companies, but there are exceptions. I'd like to add some additional color and clarity on how and why I believe a P.E. of 15 is so important and relative to valuation references on common stocks. First of all, I do not believe it's a mere coincidence that the 200-year average P.E. ratio of the S&P 500 has been somewhere between 15 to 18. Obviously, with the 15 P.E. ratio providing a better margin of safety than an 18 P.E. A complete understanding of the P.E. ratio of a valuation metric includes the realization that it's a short form of discounted cash flow. A P.E. ratio of 15 represents an earnings yield of 6.67%. This is simply made by reversing the P.E. ratio to the earnings divided by the price. Additionally, a P.E. ratio of 15 represents a valuation metric of a current earnings yield that also closely correlates with the long-term rate of return of 6 to 8% that stocks have delivered when valuations were aligned with intrinsic value or a P.E. of 15. Now, without further elaboration, my contention is that a 6 to 8% return is a rational expectation of what a typical or average company can be expected to generate over the long run. Now, admittedly, a 15 P.E. ratio doesn't apply to all stocks, but years of research and observation and experience have convinced me of the relevance and the importance of the P.E. ratio as a valuation guide. It's not perfect, but it's a good guide. And when Ben's formula is applied, as we designed on the Fast Graphs research tool, we will connotate the graph with the letters GDF, which stand for Graham-Dodd formula. Now, for companies between 5% growth and 15%, we'll use a modified version we call GDF.PEG. Now, the following earnings and price-correlated Fast Graphs will provide evidence utilizing real-world examples of the validity and practical application of Ben's formula in the real world. As a side note, as I review these graphs, I suggest that 
Each fast graph essentially provides a clear and graphic backtest of the logic founded on Ben Graham's teaching that they are based on. Now remember, there will be exceptions and there can be exceptions to this rule. So let's go ahead and turn to the fast graphs research tool and let's look at some examples where we are going to test the validity of this 15 PE ratio. So starting here with General Mills, a company that grew earnings at 5.86% over this time frame, I want to take price off the graph and I want to focus here on this orange line. Now, everywhere I touch this line, it's a P-E ratio of 15. So this orange line allows me to test whether the 15 P-E ratio builds a fair value reference. But I also want to make sure you understand that the 15 P-E ratio already has a built-in margin of safety. Remember earlier in the video, I talked about a P-E ratio from between 15 to 18, and some companies even higher. But the bottom line is here, if I put weekly closing stock prices on this graph, I want to see how the 15 P-E ratio works as a valuation reference. So let's go ahead and add those. So this black line is prices. Now you can see that the price of the stock did trade above the 15 P-E, but then eventually came back. It traded at a 15 P-E coming out of the recession of 08 and 09 almost perfectly for several years. Then valuations got high, and this actually lasted for three or four years. But then, of course, we saw this reversion to the mean, and then it often happens it overshot the reversion. And then we saw high valuation again back to the 15 PE, then real high valuation in 2023, and even 2022, and now we're back to approximately a 15 PE ratio. All right, it's actually slightly lower than that now. But we see very clearly here how Ben Graham's concept of a 15 P-E ratio works. Now, to be clear, he wanted the average of the last three earnings years. So I can use my fast graph tool here, and I can scroll back the estimate data, because I want to use real live data, and then I can go up here and I can click three years, okay? And then I can add up these numbers and then come up with the average P-E. But the point is, by just drawing it on the graph, I see that a 15 P-E ratio works very well. Now let's move on to another example. Let's look at American Electric Power. This company only had a 4% growth rate, so it is clearly less than 5% as I indicated. Once again, the orange line is a P-E ratio of 15. Anytime the stock price touches that, it's a P-E of 15. And so when the P-E is below 15, as it was here during the Great Recession, you can see those are ultimate times to buy the stock. And then of course, you know, every time it got above it, it reverted to the mean. Sometimes it takes longer than other times, but the point is the 15 PE ratio becomes a very strong valuation reference that has a margin of safety built in. If you buy a stock at a 15 PE or less, you're generally making a decision that allows you to fully participate in the growth of the business. So let's test that here. Let's look at when the P.E. was approximately 15. It was 14.74, where I drew this red dot. And then let's come out here and let's try to find a P.E. that's about the same, 14.85. And what we see is a 4.42% annualized capital appreciation, or rate of return without dividends, which mirrors very closely the 4.8% growth. Remember, I'm taking a little liberty with the time frame here. I add in dividends and I get 6.67%, which obviously is one of the reasons why Ben liked at least 20 years of dividend income. Um, that was a conservative statement. Now, you can buy stocks without paying dividends and still apply a 15 PE ratio if they grow at a lower rate than 15%. But dividends are obviously nice to have, and they also do give you a higher rate of return inevitably. Some people deny that, but that's the case for another video. The next example is another utility, a gas utility called Spire. And once again, we see 4.37% earnings growth, and we see this 15 P-E ratio creating a very strong valuation reference. Obviously, it was not optimal to buy you know, Spire when the P-E was up here at 22 almost times earnings because you could have held the stock for the next four years and actually lost money. All right, simply because of valuation, yet the company still performed extremely well. And a lot of the other 
criteria of Benz, which, by the way, just to revisit, it's adequate size. The company's market cap is $3.2 billion. Now, adequate size to Benz, I think, was $100 million in sales or more. And again, this company qualifies. It does have a significantly strong financial condition. It's an A-minus rated company. It only has 41% debt. It did pay consecutive dividends for 20 years. The company has a 10-year earnings growth rate of at least one-third in earnings per share. That would be equal to 3.37. You can see it's higher than that. I can take this down to a, around a 13-year, so that includes the estimate debt. And I, you know, I see cons- constant earnings growth over that time frame. So let's go on to another example. And this is one that I wanted to talk about, as I talked about earlier in the video. The 15 doesn't apply to every single company. Here's ConAgra with only a 2.5% growth rate. So here, the Graham-Dodd formula, again, connotated by GDF, gives me a fair value reference line of 13.5. So this is a much more conservative valuation with a better margin of safety. But once again, you can clearly see that if I pay attention to that 13.66 13.66 Graham Dodd formula indicated valuation reference that I would be buying ConAgra at optimum time. Even though this is a slow grower, if I buy it at one of these low valuations, like here, I'm buying it at 9.86 times earnings. Now, it's only trading at 11 times earnings here, but we've had very little growth, but I've still averaged over 7%, including dividends, about 4.68% which is higher than the 2.48 because I got natural leverage of buying it when the valuation was lower. Now let's move on to another example, and this is the faster growing companies. This is companies that grow above 5% but less than 15%. And Sencora is a clear example. Now the real difference here, and I want to make this clear, is the slope of this orange line is 13% instead of less than 5 as the other examples. But yet the 15 PE ratio still applies as a fair valuation reference. Fair valuation does not dictate what rate of return you would get. It simply indicates that you're buying it at a prudent or reasonable valuation. Intrinsic value, fair value, fundamental value, all those names that I talked about earlier in the video. But when you add price, we once again see that a 15 PE ratio becomes a very strong fair valuation reference. And any time you can buy the stock when it's touching a 15 PE ratio, it's probably a good decision. But because of the dynamic growth of this company, and I talked about this in a previous video, even if you pay an outlandish PE, like 25 times earnings here for Sencora, this is the old Amerisource Bergen, by the way, and today you still would be making over 9%. Now, of course, if you waited till you could get it at at approximately a 15 PE ratio, your rate of return balloons up to almost 16%. Valuation matters, and it matters a great deal. Now, moving on, here's Amdocs. This is a 9 and 3 quarter percent growth. And again, the slope of the line is 9.74%. But you can see just how clearly a 15 PE ratio will help the prudent investor make really sound decisions. And if you're patient, you will have ample opportunities to buy a stock of the quality of Amdocs with very low debt. It's a $9.91 billion. And again, it meets this thing. It has 10-year earnings growth. Now, this one does not have a dividend of 20 consecutive years. Again, that can be overlooked here with a company that has such consistency or what Ben was really looking for when he talked about 10-year growth of at least one-third in earnings per share, which was number five, and number four, where he said no earnings deficits or losses in the past 10 years. He was looking for companies with consistent operating histories like you see here with Amdocs. Okay, moving on to my last example. Here's Elements. This is another one that has double-digit growth. Once again, we see a 15 PE ratio, which is what this orange line is drawn at, provides an excellent valuation reference that can help us get a margin of safety. Of course, anytime we can buy it with lower value PE ratios, the better. Okay, now I also want to point out that fast graphs does provide you the ability to go into things like fund graphs or the financial statements. And if you go into the financial statements and go into the balance sheet and scroll down here, you can find the book value of the company, book value, tangible book value per share. Again, Ben Light's stocks, the price was no more than one and a half times book value. 
Well, sometimes you're going to get stocks today in today's service economy that are many times that. So you have to make exceptions and accommodations for things. But again, the 15 P.E. ratio concept, no more than 15 times the average P.E. ratio or the average earnings of the last three years. And again, you can do that by simply going to the last several years here and adding up the last three years earnings and getting an average. The point of this whole discussion is simply this. It is not an absolute perfect thing. Valuation is always a range. The 15 PE is kind of a bottom, if you will, of the range. 18 would be what I would consider to be a upper limit of the range, you know, looking historically at stocks. But the point is, it gives you a frame of reference, a valuation reference that you can apply and understand and believe that you're looking at investing in the company that you're looking at or examining or researching at a reasonable valuation that will allow you to fully participate in the long-term growth of the business. And you can see that very clearly by all these examples you know, that I showed you here. In summary and conclusion, I think it's important to state that I'm a major fan of Ben Graham, and I consider him one of my most important mentors. However, it's also important to recognize that Ben Graham taught some of the most renowned investors that ever walked the planet. A few of the better known are Walter J. Sloss, Tom Knapp, William J. Ruane, Charlie Munger, rest his soul, Rick Gurren, Stan Perlmutter, and finally, the most famous of all, Warren Buffett. All of these renowned investors were featured in an article by Warren Buffett published in the 1984 issue of Hermes titled The Super Investors of Graham and Doddville. However, my reason for mentioning these names is so that I can also point out that they, without exception, they all took the solid foundation that Ben Graham laid and built upon that foundation. Consequently, I suggest that we should focus more on the essence behind the principles that great teachers like Ben Graham provided and less on trying to be too technical or rigid with their application. We want valuation references. What Ben Graham was really trying to teach us was the importance of trying to identify fair value and use it to implement sound and prudent buy, sell, or hold decisions. In other words, I do not believe that Ben expected us to rigidly or fanatically attempt to apply any of his suggestions without simultaneously applying some logical thought and critical thinking behind them. Moreover, as time marches on, our knowledge base continues to grow with each passing moment. Therefore, mankind is constantly building upon and expanding our knowledge base and expanding upon our understanding of important principles in all areas of life, such as how important intangible assets could be, as Warren Buffett talked about. The principles of finance are no exception to this. In other words, the precise formulas that we use to calculate fair value may change over time, but the underlying principle of investing only when stocks are at fair value or below is timeless. Therefore, I suggest that we learn the invaluable lessons that great teachers like Ben Graham laid out for us, but at the same time, we should be willing and able to apply our expanding knowledge base by building upon the foundations that are supported. Finally, we can call it intrinsic value, fundamental value, fair value, or true worth. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that we're making sound and safe investing decisions that are based on reasonable fundamental values and that therefore we'll be able to fully participate in any of the stocks that we invest in. We should also be smart enough to recognize that any calculations of the concepts relating to the value of a stock or a business can never be perfectly precise. But most importantly, they don't really don't need to be. They only need to be accurate enough to provide us the opportunity to successfully grow our portfolios with a margin of safety and also generate the income that they can provide us over time. This is especially important for retired investors. In this part one, the focus was primarily looking at historical values. In part two, I will turn the focus towards the future and the importance of discounting cash flows. We're using discounted cash flows, not only to value a business, but to understand where and how a business gets its value. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, subscribe to my channel. And more, most importantly, subscribe to Fast Graphs. And with all these formulas we talked about, Fast Graphs really gives you a graphical interface that allows you to make sound investment decisions. Not perfect ones, but sound ones. As I like to say, Fast Graphs are the value investor's best friend. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.